Chapter Twenty of Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Ten, in which Vix comes face to face with Phileas Fogg. While these events were passing at the Opium House, Mister Fogg, unconscious of the danger he was in of losing the steamer was quietly escorting Ada about the streets of the English quarter, making the necessary purchases for the long voyage before them. It was all very well for an Englishman like Mr. Fogg to make the tour of the world with a carpet-bag. A lady could not be expected to travel comfortably under such conditions. He acquitted his task with characteristic serenity, and invariably replied to the remonstrances of his fair companion, who was confused by his patience and generosity. It is in the interest of my journey. A part of my program the purchases made they returned to the hotel where they dined at a sumptuously served table d'hote after which Auda, shaking hands with her protector after the english fashion retired to her room for rest mr fogg absorbed himself throughout the evening in the perusal of the times and the illustrated london news had he been capable of being astonished at anything it would have been not to see his servant return at bedtime but knowing the steamer was not to leave for Yokohama until the next morning, he did not disturb himself about the matter. When Passepartout did not appear the next morning to answer his master's bell, Fogg, not betraying the least vexation, contented himself with taking his carpet-bag, calling Auda, and sending for a palanquin. It was then eight o'clock. At half-past nine, it being high tide, their Carnatic would leave the harbour. Mr. Fogg and Auda got into the palanquin their luggage being brought after on a wheelbarrow, and half an hour later stepped upon the quay whence they were to embark. Mr. Fogg then learned that the Carnatic had sailed the evening before. He had expected to find not only the steamer, but his domestic, and was forced to give up both. But no sign of disappointment appeared on his face, and he merely remarked to Auda, "'It is an accident, madame. Nothing more.' At this moment a man who had been observing him attentively approached. It was Fix who bowing addressed mr fogg were you not like me sir a passenger by the rangoon which arrived yesterday i was sir replied mr fogg coldly but i have not the honour pardon me i thought i should find your servant here do you know where he is sir asked Auda anxiously what responded fix feigning surprise is he not with you no said Auda he has not made his appearance since yesterday could he have gone on board the carnatic without us without you madam answered the detective excuse me did you intend to sail in the carnatic yes sir so did i madam and i am excessively disappointed the carnatic its repairs being completed left hong kong twelve hours before the stated time without any notice being given and we must now wait a week for another steamer as he said a week fix felt his heart leap for joy fogg detained at hong kong for a week there would be time for the warrant to arrive and fortune at last favoured the representative of the law his horror may be imagined when he heard mr fogg say in his placid voice but there are other vessels besides the carnatic it seems to me in the harbour of hong kong and offering his arm to Auda, he directed his steps toward the docks in search of some craft about to start fix stupefied followed it seemed as if he were attached to mr fogg by an invisible thread chance however appeared really to have abandoned the man it had hitherto served so well for three hours phileas fogg wandered about the docks with the determination if necessary to charter a vessel to carry him to yokohama but he could only find vessels which were loading or unloading and which could not therefore set stale fix began to hope again but mr fogg far from being discouraged was continuing his search resolved not to stop if he had to resort to mikhayo when he was accosted by a sailor on one of the wharves is your honour looking for a boat have you a boat ready to sail yes your honour a pilot boat number forty three the best in the harbour does she go fast between eight and nine knots the hour will you look at her yes your honour will be satisfied with her is it for a sea excursion no for a voyage a voyage 
Yes. Will you agree to take me to Yokohama? The sailor leaned on the railing, opened his eyes wide, and said, Is your honor joking? No. I have missed the Carnatic, and I must go to Yokohama by the 14th at the latest, to take the boat for San Francisco. I am sorry, said the sailor, but it is impossible. I offer you a hundred pounds per day, and an additional reward of two hundred pounds if I reach Yokohama in time. Are you in earnest? Very much so. The pilot walked away a little distance, and gazed out to sea, evidently struggling between the anxiety to gain a large sum and the fear of venturing so far. Fix was in mortal suspense. Mr. Fogg turned to Ada and asked her, "'You would not be afraid, would you, madam?' "'Not with you, Mr. Fogg,' was her answer. The pilot now returned, shuffling his hat in his hands. "'Well, pilot?' said Mr. Fogg. "'Well, your honor,' replied he, "'I could not risk myself, my men, or my little boat of scarcely twenty tons.' on so long a voyage at this time of year besides we could not reach yokohama in time for it is sixteen hundred and sixty miles from hong kong only sixteen hundred said mr fogg it's the same thing fix breathed more freely but added the pilot it might be arranged another way fix ceased to breathe at all how asked mr fogg by going to nagasaki at the extreme south of japan or even to shanghai which is only eight hundred miles from here in going to shanghai we should not be forced to sail wide of the chinese coast which would be a great advantage as the currents run northward and would aid us pilot said mr fogg I must take the American steamer at Yokohama, not at Shanghai or Nagasaki. Why not? returned the pilot. The San Francisco steamer does not start from Yokohama. It puts in at Yokohama and Nagasaki, but it starts from Shanghai. You are sure of that? Perfectly. And when does the boat leave Shanghai? On the 11th, at 7 in the evening. We have, therefore, four days before us, that is, ninety-six hours, and in that time, if we had good luck and a southwest wind, and the sea was calm, we could make those eight hundred miles to Shanghai. And you could go? In an hour, as soon as provisions could be got aboard and the sails put up. It is a bargain. Are you the master of the boat? Yes, John Bunsby, master of the Tankadier. Would you like some earnest money? If it would not put your honor out. Here are two hundred pounds on account, sir, added Phileas Fogg, turning to Fix. If you would like to take advantage. Thanks, sir. I was about to ask the favor. Very well. In half an hour we shall go on board. But poor Passepartout, urged Ada, who was much disturbed by the servant's disappearance. I shall do all I can to find him, replied Phileas Fogg. While Fix, in a feverish, nervous state, repaired to the pilot boat, the others directed their course to the police station at Hong Kong. Phileas Fogg there gave Passepartout's description, and left a sum of money to be spent in the search for him. The same formalities having been gone through at the French consulate, and the palanquin having stopped at the hotel for the luggage, which had been sent back there, they returned to the wharf. It was now three o'clock and pilot boat number forty three with its crew on board and its provisions stored away was ready for departure the tankadier was a neat little craft of twenty tons as gracefully built as if she were a racing yacht her shining copper sheathing her galvanized ironwork her deck white as ivory betrayed the pride taken by john bunsby in making her presentable her two masts leaned a trifle backward she carried brigantine foresail storm jib and standing jib and was well rigged for running before the wind and she came capable of brisk speed which indeed she had already proved by gaining several prizes in the pilot boat races the crew of the tankadier was composed of john bunsby the master and four hardy mariners who were familiar with the chinese seas 
John Bunsby himself, a man of forty-five or thereabouts, vigorous, sunburnt, with a sprightly expression of the eye, and energetic and self-reliant countenance, would have inspired confidence in the most timid. Phileas Fogg and Alida went on board, where they found Fix already installed. Below deck was a square cabin, of which the walls bulged out in the form of cots, above a circular divan. In the centre was a table provided with a swinging lamp. The accommodation was confined, but neat. "'I'm sorry I have nothing better to offer you,' said Mr. Fogg to Fix, who bowed without responding. The detective had a feeling akin to humiliation in profiting by the kindness of Mr. Fogg. "'It's certain.' thought he though rascal as he is he is a polite one the sails and the english flag were hoisted at ten minutes past three mr fogg and Alda, who were seated on deck cast a last glance at the quay in the hope of espying passepartout fix was not without his fears lest chance should direct the steps of the unfortunate servant whom he had so badly treated in this direction in which case an explanation the reverse of satisfactory to the detective must have ensued but the Frenchman did not appear, and, without doubt, was still lying under the stupefying influence of the opium. John Bunsby, master, at length gave the order to start, and the tankadier, taking the wind under her brigantine, foresail, and standing jib, bounded briskly forward over the waves. End of chapter 20